Hey there, it's Jean here with Waldorf Inspired Learning, and I'm so excited to have another conversation with Janet Langley, one of the co-authors of The Roadmap to Literacy. Hey, Janet. Hi there, Jean. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And for those of you who haven't seen it, this is the uh, wonderful book that we're going to be talking about today, The Roadmap to Literacy. And Janet uh, co-authored this with Jennifer Millitzer Copperall. And we've had two previous uh, wonderful conversations about the book. And if you haven't watched those yet, you can find them on my website, waldorfinspiredlearning.com. And the first one is uh, Developing Literacy in the Early Elementary Grades. And the second one is Developing Literacy with the Roadmap to Literacy book. Yes. <laughs> Today, this is interview number three out of four. This has been so great because Janet and I both have a love for language arts and teaching and homeschooling. Yes. <laughs> and um, today we're going to talk about planning. We're diving into planning. Mm -hmm. We're dividing this up. Today we'll talk about planning main lessons and next time we will talk about planning practice sessions. So great. Yeah, very, very important. Yeah. It's June here as we are recording this, and a lot of teachers and homeschoolers are thinking about summertime, hooray, mm -hmm. here in the Northern Hemisphere at least. We're thinking about summertime, thinking about how can we get a jump start on our planning for next year and also have a little bit of fun, right? Um, and then what's next year you know going to look like how is that going to play out so we thought janet and i thought it would be really nice um we discovered there was a a story from the book and a story from my own life that are kind of similar so janet why don't you start and share this is a story that's at the beginning of the section on planning in the roadmap to literacy book and right. a, and a story from your own life right janet Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, this is at the beginning of section five, the planning section of our book. And uh, basically, I was doing what just about every teacher I knew was doing um, in planning was that doing going to an art of teaching in the summer, doing a little some planning, but mainly planning every block for the most part, the couple of weeks, certainly intensely the weekend before it started. And um, and so, along with um, life as it happens, um, by the end of every school year, I was exhausted, and um, so were my colleagues. Um, and we had a new colleague join us, Isabel Tabaco. And after the year end, and we were all sitting around in our faculty meetings, I noticed that every single one of us is so burned out except for Isabel. <laughs> and I thought, and, and here she was, a new teacher, um, married, two young children, and she drove quite a distance to get to school every day. And she was as involved with helping out the, you know, the school um, on committees and stuff as, as, I, as I was. And so I was like, what is this all about? <laughs> and so I went to her and I asked her, I said, Isabel, why are you not burned out like the rest of us? And she just, uh, and she said, well, I use the summer for planning. And I went, you know, it's just like, well, well so do I. Uh, but then she went on to say that what she does is that every morning during the summer, she would get up at 8 o'clock, 8 8.30, have her coffee, read the newspaper, whatever. And then at 9 o'clock, she was at her desk. And she would be there till 12 or 1230, um, working on planning the next year's curriculum. And so she was reading poetry. She was reading the stories, the literature for the year to come. Um, she would do a painting uh, that she wanted to do or a drawing. Um, you know, she was researching the academic curriculum. She certainly, had it been there, would have been reading our book, uh, <laughs> especially the portions that... Um, you know, that pertain to the year to come. And uh, she would be researching uh, plays and field trips. And by the end of the school year, uh, by the end of the summer, she 
also took two weeks off where she did nothing but read sci-fi and go on vacation with her family. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and in the afternoon, um, you know, she would go play with her kids and they would go swimming and to the river and, you know, so she had a, a summer that was, had um, a balance between planning and yeah. fun activities with family and friends. Yeah. And when she got to the end of her summer, her, you know, her, the classroom was completely done. Her blocks were very well planned out. The first two completely planned out day mm -hmm, by day. Mm -hmm. uh, she knew what play she was going to do. She knew had all of her field trips lined up. I mean, it was amazing. Right. She yeah. had all the literature done. And, and so I thought, I'm going to do that. Uh -huh. I'm going to try that. And so I did. And it changed my life. Yeah. It, you know, I mean, yeah. It, you know, teaching was not a burnout after that. It was just a it, lot of fun. It's so interesting because I think there is a similarity among homeschoolers. So for me, my life changed when I figured out how to use the summer to do some planning, which I, in fact, I'd already done. I think a lot of homeschoolers are working on thinking through what they're going to do next fall during the summer. But we often are focused on um, not the wrong things, but we stay focused on sort of the big picture view for too right. long and we don't get into the specifics. So I love that suggestion of having a couple, at least the first one or two blocks completely planned out right. by the end of the summer. Because what I find among homeschoolers is that we can just go back and forth, change our minds. Oh, I'll do this block here. Oh no, I'm going to do this block there and spend weeks <laughs> considering those things without getting into the nitty gritty of the plans themselves. Right. So right. For me, it's a very similar thing where my summer changed because I had been spending practically every spare moment doing some planning and considering, mm -hmm. but I wasn't focused on the most productive pieces or aspects. Right. So it changed when I created a system for myself of starting from the big picture view and working down to the, the, the main lesson blocks mm -hmm. that I was going to do each month you know, which topic, and then the weekly rhythm, and then the daily rhythm, and the lesson planning. Yes. So working from the whole to the parts. But parts. In, yeah, but in the, these really specific steps so that I could be more productive and compartmentalize that so that I could have some fun with my family too. So right. we, we, sure. need, we not only want, we need both of those, right, yes. when we have a break. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I think that's just great, the, the overlap of those two stories and a really good place to start. Sure. So today we are talking about uh, planning specifically main lessons, but mm -hmm. let's tell us just quickly the distinction between, as you see it, between mm -hmm. The main lesson work and then these practice sessions, because this is kind of a newer conversation in the homeschooling world that that we want to be um, practicing skills, you know, for a little bit of time each day as well. So, so right. describe how you how you um, talk about that. Okay, sure. Uh, in fact, it's not only in the homeschooling world is this right. a new idea, but uh, in in the classrooms at first, second, third grade, it's a new idea as well. And um, however, if you do any research about how young children learn, two things are really very, very clear. One is that they learn from story and image. Mm -hmm. um, when you can connect a concept to their own ex life experience um, or story they've heard, you know, imaginations, pictures already in their head then they can learn much easier. And in fact, research is out there now saying that that's true for adults as well. Um, and, <laughs> and the second thing is that young children need anywhere from 12 to 18 exposures of a particular concept where they're actually paying attention um, to, uh, um, to actually learn it. And it's called, and, and, in the brain, neurological research shows that there's something called myelination, which is really this creating of these memory pathways, these neural pathways. And so it, it doesn't 
it doesn't matter how incredibly creative you are and how much time you spend on this wonderful introduction to a new concept if you don't give the child the opportunity to practice it and practice it until they've learned it and um, that number of exposures uh, by the end of third grade when students are um, have had a lot more opportunity for practicing and learning it might take just five exposures yeah um, and yeah. any different uh, the, the reason 12 to 18 I mean that's a 33 percent difference but your child may catch on at 12 or they may need 18 or you know and sometimes maybe they only need uh you know right five if, if they have a real strong visual um memory capacity well and i just think that it's worth underscoring that concept that the myelination of the brain and is critical to the left and right sides of the brain communicating with each other, which is critical to happen before a child can read. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that practice right. <laughs> contributes to this myelination is a really important foundational concept for us as teachers and parents and homeschoolers to understand. Right. Yes, yes, and so the difference, there is a time, and we call those main lessons, uh, or a main lesson block, uh, mm -hmm. that you're introducing a number of, of new concepts throughout that time. Mm -hmm. However, um, in order for the child to actually really learn that concept, um, that child is going to need to practice um, a certain amount every day at the beginning. We call it skills practice. In our main lesson, we'll see this later, um, in our template. And then they'll actually even need to continue on practicing in a like a side practice class when they're in a math block. So yeah. Yeah. we have this alteration, right? If you're in a language arts block, later on in the day, you have at least one 45-minute, um, hour-long practice session for... Um, math and then if you're in a math block you have later on that day a practice session for language arts and this is how uh well actually the teachers that have been doing this the last few years are blown away mm -hmm. by how they can make it fun yeah with these practice activities it doesn't have to be boring or rote at all um and um yeah and then you yeah. know the kids learn then they really actually learn it rather than yeah. showing up four years later and actually not having that phonics rule or not having that concept at all. Yeah, or retaining it, right? Yeah. Like they've been introduced to it, but it's not right. in there in the way that we want it to be. And I really, um, I think this is a great conversation because it's helpful for homeschoolers who've actually been copying classroom teachers, right? Yes. To understand that this is a new conversation everywhere, yes, you know, and is. so don't feel bad. You know, I mean, I started homeschooling 25 years ago. I had no idea. I mean, I was trained as a language arts teacher, so I would build in a little bit of practice, mm -hmm. but there wasn't there wasn't this specific conversation around it and how to right. do it. So right. yeah. I'm so yes. excited that, yeah, that we're able to bring some examples. So today we're going to talk about the main lesson, the introduction yep. of new mm -hmm. skills um, that we can pull out of stories. We can pull out of poems. We can pull out of a lots of different imagery, right? right. And then next, com next interview, we're going to talk specifically about that, that how to design um, a skills practice session. Yes. And in the homeschool setting, sometimes it's 20 to 30 minutes, but that is it's true. That's true. Yeah. If it's focused, it's yeah. way better to like have your main lesson block for your hour and a half to three hours at home. It doesn't usually uh -huh. take three hours ever, but, mm -hmm. but, and then, you know, afterward or right after lunch, like late morning or right after lunch, do a little bit of skills practice from skills that you've already introduced previously. Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. In fact, when I was homeschooling my first and third grade grandsons, yeah. I, when I think about it, yeah, I, we probably only did that practice for about 20 to 30 minutes because that's that they were able to cover 
what it was because yeah, it's and you're more one on one or one on, on yes. a couple, yes. you know, and yes. you can just work through it. But this is super helpful, this distinction, and for everybody to know, this is a newish conversation. So I'm just so happy um, that we have some really specific guidance for you, thanks to Janet and Jennifer's book, The Roadmap to Literacy. So um, we're going to move into. Um, well, first I want to say, I, I also, I teach a course called Plan It Out. I run it every right. June. Yeah. So those of you who are interested in um, working through a planning six-step process that I created for myself and now I help other homeschoolers with, I'll put the link below the video. Um, but it's similar in a lot of ways. So both the book um, and my course really encourage you as the as the homeschooler teacher to to just design some sort of template for yourself so wonderfully the book uses those as part of the curriculum and they can be found online thanks mm -hmm. to, to uh, Janet and Waldorf Inspirations so it's waldorfinspirations.com and I'm going to share my screen right now just to show you the website and where you can find the forms that then we're going to talk about here today. Thanks. Yeah, so here is the Waldorf Inspirations website. And yes. uh, it is, I hope I'm not blocking. Okay. Um, sorry, I should have hidden that bar but I didn't okay um so tell us I'm in the second grade planning section so actually are. I'm going to start at the home when you get to the website this is what you see yes that's what you see and the and if you look um to the right of the orange Waldorf Inspiration sign, you'll see there's the homepage where we are. The Roadmap to Literacy, this is where you will find, uh, well, you'll actually, pretty soon you'll find links to these um, interviews. And, yes. but also there are a number at the very bottom, unfortunately, we're getting ready to redesign this entire page, but yes. so here you go, yes. teacher planning forms. And so there are blank forms, there are example forms, um, for everything that we have in the book and some miscellaneous forms, some are planning forms. So anyway, definitely go in and take a look at those and they are grade specific. Um, yeah. there are forms for grade one or sometimes, um, this, there's the same form used for grade two and three, although the example forms will be filled out one for grade two, one for grade three. Yeah. Um, yes. But anyway, so the, so this roadmap to literacy section is specific to roadmap. However, if you go, can you go to the top again? Yes. Okay. If you look at the grade section. Yes. Then, and, and go down, like, let's go down to second grade again. Okay, yeah. there's a language arts and there's also a planning. Mm -hmm. and, um, the, in a minute, there's going to be a, um, a sample yearly block rotation idea that you can find here in the second grade planning. Um, but also up in the language arts, mm -hmm. there are all kinds of examples in their files that show activities and teaching ideas and definitely make sure that you check out yes. um, what's available. For example, we were talking earlier, Jean and I, about um, how to use a fable. Yeah, and here, right here. And are here are short fables that Patty wrote, um, I believe, that, are, uh, that you could use as a second grade reader. Yeah. And, uh, and then there are verses also um, that you could teach out of and example daily lesson plans. I have to say that we spent about three months going through the entire site, especially for second, third grade, making sure that everything that was here for language arts reflects roadmap, um, the roadmap rhythm, the roadmap oh, concepts. And yeah. so yeah, all of this really supports 
Yes. It just gives you more ideas and activities to do with your child. Yeah. And I will say, okay, I'm going to just stop sharing my screen and we'll come back. But I will say that I point so many homeschoolers to the, the site and it, there, it's just a treasure trove. There are games, there are verses. There's just so many wonderful resources to be found there. In addition to the forms that we're going to be talking about. Right. Today, exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, um, so we just wanted to have a brief conversation um, about this uh, uh, this shift that's happening in in how we learn to bring the Waldorf approach to children, right? Yes. And so um, Janet and I have had a, a chance to talk about this um, for a while here during this this interview series and. This idea that even classroom teachers, because again, homeschoolers are really copying classroom teachers, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is the perfect time to have this conversation because in just a couple of months, uh, Waldorf education will officially be 100 yes. years old. Yes. So, so this idea that um, we can responsibly innovate, right? And that we want yes. the approach to evolve in helpful, healthy ways, right? right. And, right. And, um, and so the segue really is this idea, and all of you who've heard me before know that there is sort of this curriculum that Rudolf Steiner, he never wrote a curriculum, but he listed no. stories that he thought were appropriate for different ages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so classroom teachers, as well as homeschoolers, become familiar with this pretty simple two-day rhythm of introducing a story on the first day, doing some sort of artistic activity with it, reviewing it on the second day, and writing a summary. Right. So the question then is, how do we expand on that uh, rhythm so that we can be introducing some specific language art skills within a block? And that's really where we're headed today with this conversation. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Great. Um, yeah. Do you want me to say something about that right now? Or? Yeah, go ahead and then we'll pull up the forms and get to some specific uh, things. Okay. So I mentioned earlier, and I know Gina's talked to you about this, that um, we want to teach out of an image. We want to teach out of a story. We want for the child to just, in, just flawlessly move from the imagination, the picture, the story into whatever you're introducing, as if this is just part of my life experience of this. This is just the next step. Um, you know, we don't want to just out of the blue say, oh, you know, this is the letter B and it makes the bus sound and the child is going, mm -hmm. right. Right. So in context, that yes. is so important. Yes. yes exactly. So, um, so we always want to, to teach out of the image. However, this, the um, definition of image has expanded, um, <laughs> let's say. Oh, and that, uh, yes, we can use a story mm -hmm. to introduce an academic concept. Mm -hmm. We can use a poem that the students have learned. Uh, and we're talking about first, second, third grade here. Um, yeah. Later on, you could do it cold turkey, but right now, um, it's so something that they've learned, and then you ha then you have it up on the board, or you have hand it the you know handwritten sheet to the child, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you can pull out um, a, you know some lessons from that. Um, but uh, you also, of course, can use a story, just a soul food, uh, just it's a story that you love. And that, um, you know, your child either loves or needs, <laughs> depending on what, if it's pedagogical or not in nature. Um, and that, uh, and maybe it's the inspiration for a, a drawing and, um, you know, maybe a title for the picture or something that might incorporate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or might not incorporate mm -hmm. something you've learned. Um, it also would be a wonderful inspiration for painting. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, or a little play, a little drama. Uh, 
Absolutely. You know, yeah, so and I talk a lot to parents about, and, and I think you share this, um, this tactic too, where we can be bringing stories. We can share stories at mealtimes. We can share stories at bedtime. We can, you know, share stories in the afternoon. There are all kinds of ways and, and places where we can bring these stories. And right. this idea of the soul food stories, um, those are the stories that really come from um, Steiner's list, right? That he put up on the chalkboard for those very first Waldorf teachers. And he did also say uh, in his lectures to those first teachers that sharing a story and just letting it be mm -hmm. it can be a, a really important um, activity to do with children. So right. there are lots and lots of ways uh, to bring stories. And specifically today, because Janet and I have both found that among classroom teachers and homeschoolers, um, we, I'll put myself in that category, often feel baffled as to how to integrate or weave in um, introducing specific skills yes. right, to yes. the lesson. So that's right. what we're going to get to now. And of course, the book, as well as you can find these forms on the WaldorfInspirations.com right. website that we just showed you. Um, we have two forms to look at. And one, the first one is a blank form. Right. And this is, again, where I would encourage you. And so would Janet create your own template from this, right. you know, whatever makes the most sense for you and whatever grade your child is in. We're going to use grade two, second grade as our example today. Mm -hmm. um, but feel free, you know, I teach this in my Plan It Out course too. You want to make this work for you. Yes. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, so we have a blank form, and then we have one filled out that I think is really going to show you. It's going to be um, the light bulb, right? <laughs> for, right? For how you can go about bringing these skills, the introduction of new concepts, language arts concepts, and skills to your children. Uh -huh. So, okay, yeah. so first the blank form. Are we ready for that? Yeah. Okay, all right, I'm going to show you this form here. Oh, no, actually, sorry, we're not going to look at that first. There are three forms. We're going to look at first the block rotation form for the year because, again, right. this, right. this distinguishes between, you can see the headings here um, under, so this is a second grade block rotation. The first four weeks we're looking at here, um, show that uh, the, the ideas that you're going to be focusing on for main lesson and the ideas that you're going to focus on for uh, a practice block. And this is what um, I wanted Janet to just talk about a little bit first before we get into the forms are going to focus on one week, a plan for one week at a time. Right. right. So you, you would find over this. You. Yeah. Uh, right. You over. would find this. Um, for I think first, second, and third grade, uh, on the actually in the grade section, not in the roadmap section. Yeah, and I'll have website. a link to it, Janet. Yeah. With the oh, okay, great, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, and what we're doing today is we're talking about the right hand, I mean the left hand column, which are the main lesson blocks. Yeah, right in here. Yes, mm -hmm. our next session will be about the um, practice blocks mm -hmm. and. Um, that are ongoing, those practice classes that are ongoing, you know, language when there's a math block at main lesson. Um, so we encourage uh, starting in second grade to begin the year with a math block. And that way it gives you time to, uh, in your practice sessions, to practice and review the skills from the year before. And that uh, we really l looked at which would benefit from that the most and you can review the the math skills pretty quickly and chances are with your with your homeschooling you've been doing little math activities with your students all over the summer mm -hmm. and uh, just any time life pro, you know provides an opportunity um, and so uh, we you know, we um, encourage you to start off with a math block 
and then use that first practice block time that during that month to um, review your your literacy skills um, and there's a um, in the in the book in roadmap it does give you quite a few examples of um, you know what you should be reviewing yeah it's yeah. pretty clear this is what you should review during that right that if you covered those in in and grade one. yes so then the second block is what we're going to look at today right, right. 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 So, so it's really your first language arts main lesson block of the year, but it's the second block of the year as Janet just described as, as, as she's recommending. So, yeah. um, so fables are kind of the story container, right, that we're using. And then we're looking at uh, word families and vowel teams. So again, this is a really helpful overview of the year because it shows you now, if you look at that second block, the second four weeks of the year, that while you're doing this um, language main lesson block, the first main language main lesson block you're doing during your practice time, you're doing math practice, um, you're, you're yeah. practicing math skills. And, yes. and that's what, as we've said, we're going to talk about how to design one of those practice sessions next interview. Yes. All yes. right. So great. So I'll put a link to this uh, form, um, this overview below okay. the video. And now I have to stop and start again, which is a little clunky, but I'm going to stop sharing this screen. And here we are. And now we're going to look at the blank form right. for planning. Um, if this is actually second eight or third grade um, yeah. main lesson block. Right. Yeah, so right. tell, talk us through this template. It's really just a one-page template that represents a week. And you yep. can see, so you see the days of the week across the top, and then you see some, the activities over on the left with some suggested time um, uh, right. frames <laughs> associated right. with it. So tell us a little bit, and you'll see, if you look at this whole, it's, it's one page, right? Yes. Yes. If it's not filled out, it's one page. <laughs> right. um, yeah. So one of the things that we really had to do when writing the Roadmap to Literacy was reimagine how main lessons had been set up uh, traditionally here in the United States before. Um, please know that, you know, what we were doing here isn't necessarily at all what's being done in the rest of the world. And um, certainly uh, these the opening that was often 45 minutes circle of um you know singing and verses and all of that um it was almost you know like solely done here i think and uh something that christoph fiekert really the past director of the pedagogical section that we um refer to in our book quite a bit um you know he just was why are you doing that it's <laughs> They, they come to school to learn and they're ready. <laughs> um, so anyway, this opening uh, is only 12 to 15 minutes. And that's just really to kind of get them, you know, pulled in and focused, ready to learn. And it's more of bringing them together. Here we are. You were exactly, in right. exactly what I, I share, you know, and yeah. this idea of circle time, it's a, this mashup, right? It's actually the UK as well as the United States, where yes. we had these nursery schools that had circle times. And so we combined that right. with what we thought was happening in a Waldorf classroom. And suddenly it's 45 minutes long and everybody's tired at the end. And tired, yes. And you've, and you've really blown. Well, in fact, you'll see where we actually move that time. And that's in this next session. Yeah, so yeah. Of that. At home, oh, I just want to say at yeah. home, sometimes the opening can be 10 minutes. Oh, and yeah. the opening is falling apart, light a candle and say your verse. It's really a go. gathering. It's a, it's a, you know, coming together to, to there start you go. saying, okay, it's time. We're all going to gather now and be together for our main lesson. Our lesson. Uh, yes. In fact, in fact, Christoph had said, you know, you may have an idea of what your opening will be, but then you look at who are the, the children or who is the child in front of me today? What do they need? Yes. To help them just get centered and, and present. 
Exactly. You know, and sometimes it's something more active and sometimes it's something more calming. <laughs> yes, it, it could, yeah, it could be some breathing, you know, some kind of a little yeah. yoga thing. Right. <laughs> um, exactly. So, uh, so the opening um, is whatever you feel that is, um, you know, meeting your child that day and uh, we take the opportunity you'll see in the, the filled out version to uh, teach a, a poem to the children over the space of a week. Yeah. And so anyway, we'll, we'll see that. Um, the skills practice. Now this is that we've taken 30 minutes out of that 45 minute circle to use a skill practice. And this is really where the myelination happens. This is where the learning happens. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we want to make sure that we do that one really quick note. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be, and still is uh, in a lot of places, that this skills practice was about five minutes long and it was mental math practice. And um, what we're saying is that oh. we want to uh, warm up the literacy brain. Oh, interesting. For the language skills. You save me uh, mental math for your math practice class later in the day or some other time um, in the day, but, but the main lesson is two hours that you're, or hour and a half, whatever you're doing, should be focused on um, uh, literacy. It should be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. So uh, now we go down to the next. Yes. Part. So and then we have a, yeah. Okay. Well, one of the things we'll, we'll talk about in, in skills practice is that skills practice will include movement. So yes. young children have to move. We're not saying you should take away their movement at all when we say get rid of that big circle. Um, we're, just, uh, we're just interweaving it and where it's working with the actual natural rhythms of the child. Yeah, so you'll I see, say that all the time too. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. And so then there's a transition between each major segment of main lesson is a time for a transition. Mm -hmm. and it's the, the signal that that session is ended. Mm-hmm. Then, uh, you know, you're preparing for the next one. And um, if there's been a lot of movement in your practice session, then maybe your transition is just a poem or a song. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, so it's, you know, again, you're the, you're the artist. You are, this is the art of teaching. It, you know, it's creating this yep. rhythm mm -hmm. that flows for your child. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have the introduction or review. So it's, you're either introducing a new concept or you're reviewing it. Right. Depending then, on which day and your rhythm. Yeah. Again, again. And then there's transition and we'll see what those could be when we look at the filled out example right. work. Yep. Good. Right. And, um, and then, uh, then I think it ends with a, does it end with another little transition and a story? Is that the rest of the? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I also might mention that story if the story is going to be used the next day for teaching, um, you can include it here. Uh, but actually, in homeschooling, you can include your story any time during the day. It does not have to be a main lesson. Yeah. It's wherever it fits. I, in fact, one of the things that, that um, we, you know, we talk about is that if, you're, if your child is really, really into a project, like they're really into writing something. They're really into searching um, their reader for examples of diphthongs that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, yeah, let them do it and, and uh, pay attention when they're starting to be done. Yeah, and stop. But yep, and the energy um, begins to shift. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. But if that means that you do the story after lunch or you do the story a little later on, yeah, that's yep. fine. Yeah, and I think that's one of the incredible benefits of homeschooling is we really yeah. can look at the children before us and we can shift gears, right, during the day. And, and another little comment about that is that some children won't need this many transitions, right? Some children oh, right. won't be able to smoothly go from one activity to another. Others won't. So again, it's really customizing it, the flow right. and the right. rhythm to suit you. Yes, my two grandsons, one was a wiggle worm, and he would absolutely have needed this along with activities, you know, right. movement yeah. and, yeah. and uh, skills practice. However, my other grandson, he could have sat 
and done, you know, half hour, 40 minutes of writing or drawing or whatever it was. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah know? It's so so you're absolutely right. It depends yeah. on your child. It does depend on your child. Okay, now we're going to show you. You're going to see us pop on again for a second. Okay. And we now have, um, this, is, this is a great example. And again, you can find these at WaldorfInspirations.com. This is a filled out form that shows you uh, this one, that, sh that shows you this, that exact same structure, really. It's a one week plans for one week, Monday through Friday. It has some timestamps down the left with the activity and it has some specific um activities listed out this is this is what it might look like if you were filling out this form um yeah. to create your weekly plans yeah yes yeah. exactly now two things i want i maybe want to say or three one is that if you're going to be doing a, a planning a a block that is mainly going to be focused on phonics rules in the pattern phase of second grade mm -hmm. um which is i mean there are there are a lot of really important um, phonics rules to be taught during this this um, year or during this phase. Mm -hmm. um, and so you'll want to do two things. One is that before you uh, jump into planning your first block of the year, you're going to want to reread chapter 3.4 on encoding and decoding. Mm -hmm. And that will really give you all the background, everything you need to be thinking about. And right. that's in the third section. The fourth section is all phonics rules. Actually, the fourth section is a subset of, uh -huh. of that chapter on encoding and decoding. It was just way, way too long to yeah. put in that chapter. Um, the other thing is that, and, and that, um, that chapter starts on page 144. Okay. And then um, on page 366, you will see the protocol for teaching phonics skills. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, you'll also, it's one page, but you'll want to review that and make sure you yes. re yourself with that. Okay. Yes. So now Hold we're on. looking at this mm -hmm. and I told Jean as I was actually um, looking at how this was filled out, I realized it's not really for week one, it's for week two because uh, yeah. it's obvious in how it's filled out that there had to be a preceding week because um, the idea of diphthongs, which are vowel teams uh, that work together, um, and you'll see examples yeah. of them down here. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. That they are, they've been introduced. And yes. in fact, the O, I, um, where is O, it? Y have, were. Did I go too far? Uh, yeah, you did. Let's yeah, yeah, yeah. There it is. Yeah. Okay. So you have your opening and then you as you'll see. Right. Um, so here's the opening. Right. With, uh -huh. um, yeah, a poem, a verse, a song. Right. Okay. Right. Yep. And then, um, oh, can you go back a second just to the opening? As yeah. you can see, what you can do in that opening is that you can teach a poem and maybe, you know, the first four lines. And right. then the like stands of I stand like you're adding a little bit. Yeah. More. By yeah. the end of the week, they know all 10 lines. And yeah. um, anyway, okay. So uh, then we look at the skills practice. Right. And you'll find um, those syllable cards and mystery cards. This is really has to do with um, with sight reading more than anything else. Um, but also decoding. Uh, you know specific words and that's um, on page 170 to 172 how to use those in the book uh, So this is skills. So they're they're practicing their skills on You know using these um, Different activities and then on Monday you'll want to introduce the sight words that you're going to be working with your child that week and um, right, so the, uh, Sight words yeah. are on page 575 in our book um, is the sight word uh, list, yeah. List, uh huh. It's the curriculum, and really, if you begin in first grade working with them, you should be done with all 270 by the end of second grade. Mm -hmm. And those are, and you know, and sight words um, are so important for fluency, mm -hmm. reading fluency. Um, since those 270 represent 
I think 66% of all written words on the page. So it's really right. nice. Sorry. Yeah. 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 And yeah. so these are words that children just can see the word and they know it. Right. So it's right. almost, I, I remember, um, I could practically see my oldest figuring this out and he, he was a very late reader actually, right. uh -huh. but he, you could, like he memorized shapes of words. Yes. And, um, and that's often, yeah, what children do, that the sight words are different than the decoding. So yes. Yes. that's why um, Janet is saying, go back and review the decoding and encoding before you. <laughs> right, right. And yeah, planning, right. And then, and then at, in first grade, if you start with roadmap, then you'll read the sight word chapter and it will give you everything you need. Yeah you'd be able to start that. Um, and so then if you'll notice that because I, uh, because I'm getting ready to introduce the diphthongs, the vowel teams of OW and OI mm -hmm. that I chose off my list of hundreds, uh, you know, well, probably 250 sight words. I chose down and around Yep. Um, because they have the OW and the OU sound that I'm going to be teaching this week. So you can combine them together. Um, then yeah, we so you're integrating and you can also be pulling these out as it shows on Tuesday, that second column, really the third column. But you can pull these out of songs, verses, stories, yes. um, et cetera. So it can Absolutely. all be woven in together into one main lesson block this represents a week of that block yes but yeah there's a relationship between yeah. the, yes. the story and the skill uh and the practice right right thank you for pointing that out yes you're right there's um the poem you could be working on can have examples of the sight words and the sight words could be examples of the of the um, phonics rule that you're teaching. I mean, yes, you can yeah. um, blend them all together very nicely. Um, so then in skills practice, you're introducing the sight words, then the rest of the week, you're going to be working with those sight words in various ways. Mm -hmm. um, and then another section, and, and this is about 10 minutes when you introduce sight words. Mm -hmm. And then the next section will be um, the decoding and the encoding mm -hmm. of the OI and the OI diphthongs yep. that you taught last week. Mm -hmm. And um, also, you can use examples of words that have the another vowel team example, which that you've taught just you know before, which would be um, when two vowels go walking, the first one does the talking and usually says its name, like in sale, S A I. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, uh, and C S E A those those uh, E A is C E. Uh, anyway, so this is a place where we're really myelinating those pathways. Mm -hmm. We're helping the children, um, really preparing them for learning to read. Yes, both with sight words and with this encoding decoding of things that have just been introduced, but chances are they don't they don't really know them that well yet mm -hmm. uh, okay so we can move on yeah and then then we have a transition and then there's yes yeah, so by the time you've done those skills reviews especially depending on how much they've been sitting those little yep. ones are going to be ready to get up yeah and move and so um you you know get your child out of the chair and and do some poem or song something uh e bags i love these little moments of transition these few minutes because that's what i always say so many homeschoolers will say circle time doesn't work at home my kids act out i can't you know we're a too small a group they feel self-conscious they you know yes. they're in competition yes. whatever the reason is this right. is what I suggest too, is to weave it in. And so I love how this um, shows really specifically how you might do that. Yeah, yeah. Christoph Beaker calls this purposeful movement. Yes, and, so uh, important, so, <laughs> so important. Bean bags yeah. are one of the most important uh, exactly. household items to have in your home. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, uh, and so then, um, then is time for introducing a new rule. This, yeah. and we're, we're, we're in a block where phonics rules are the focus. The next block, when you look at that whole year long block rotation, you'll see the next block, grammar and language mechanics will be a focus. So we, mm -hmm. you know, we, we mix it up here and there. Um, 
But uh, so this is phonics rule number 11, the diphthongs. And this is the O, U, O, W, the OW. Yeah. yeah. Right. And uh, then, um, and we'll be working at this point. What we would do since we'd already introduced the diphthongs through um, an imagination the week before uh, and everything, we would say, well, you know, oh, I know why mm -hmm. our, you know, um, have cousins. And their cousins, instead of saying the oi word uh, sound, they make the ow sound. And so this doesn't take a huge story right. to be able to just sort of transition in. They're already in that imagination already. And so the fact that they have cousins, why yeah. wouldn't oi and oi have a cousin, <laughs> right? right. And, just like OI, the, and just like the sound oi that has two different ways to spell it, Ow has two different ways to spell it too, but then so then you go in the activity would be um, the you know brainstorming all the different um, uh, sounds uh, yeah. words yeah. you know yeah. yeah and then but what you want to do is make sure that when you write them on your blackboard mm -hmm. that if a ch if your child gives you the word owl you write it on the O W column but it doesn't say O W at the top yet. And then you do the OU ones on the other column. Then you ask them if they can find, you know, what's the difference between these two yep. columns of words? And then you put the OW and the OU up there and they get it. You yeah. know, that's some like, words. Oh, and that's one of the things. There's so many wonderful activities in the Roadmap to Literacy book and at WaldorfInspirations.com. Yeah. So, so many lots to do with that and then also if you go into the uh, into the diphthong um page 11 let's i mean rule 11 let's see that starts on page 386 um that you'll see it has um, an idea for how you would uh do book work in uh which is coming up but um yeah. yeah so we have a transition again uh -huh. and use those same ideas and then it's right time yeah yeah now so here you see and as a homeschool parent you have to, you can decide uh how you want to work with this um right because you don't have to break out sections of the class right, right. so yeah. you might you might read you might spend um you know 10 minutes reading with them 15 minutes reading something that they're ongoing working with you could then have them do a kid writing Mm -hmm. um example and we i think we talked about kid writing in our last session but yes. well, yeah. usually important to continue this yeah. and, and during second grade it will transition from kid writing into composition mm -hmm. and and one of the reasons you'll know when to make that transition is when they're kid writing it's pretty much accurate yes you know, you know then they're comp they're composing and and then you can give them you know, then they can start writing stories about, um, you know, maybe a St. Patrick or, you know, um, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. A specific. Yeah. Topic, right. Rather and, than. And you could also, because the thing is, is that your students, uh, your student over the week is going to want to need to do all these things. So then um, you could decide maybe they you do two out of these three or maybe you do all three it depends yeah. on so it depends on that student right you know so my youngest again, grandson right do all those and love it yeah yeah <laughs> right and and again we're looking at the child before us yeah. and yeah. bringing them not only bringing them what they need but steiner talked a lot about the economy of teaching and that he didn't want us as teachers to exhaust the children right exactly. we, we want to keep things lively yes. so that um they can stay focused right. uh, and we want to be paying attention and observing their behavior so that we know how much uh to bring them and when right yeah right exactly exactly All right. Um, and so anyway, then, then you have the story is the fable of the tortoise and the hare. Yep. So we um, have that. Now we're at the, at the, um, really the end of the main mm -hmm. lesson. Of the first day. Um, for the, of, yes. Uh, yeah. Of this week. And, and then what your um, readers can do, I mean, readers, I'm, 
I'm writing a book. Um, <laughs> you know, what your viewers can do is by going to this form, they can watch and see how the different aspects are developed over the week. Right. So, so how, um, for example, how the tortoise and the hare on yes. Monday, the story from Monday affects um, or is interwoven into the activities on Tuesday. Yes, yes. Right. And if you'll go up just a little bit um, to, right, well, write book work. Okay. Yes, yes. So um, this idea of going down where it says the many shades of brown, mm -hmm. well, this is a really fun acrostics poem. And acrostics means that the first letter of every line. Right. If you, you know, if you take that letter, it spells the word that is the title. Yes. Of yeah. the poem. So, yeah. it, but, and we're right. studying OW, right? Yep. The L sound. So this is bobcats are tawny, mm -hmm. and then you would add brown. Mm -hmm. Robins are soft, brown. Otters are sleek, brown. Wolves are frosty, brown. Oh. Mongooses are striped, brown. Uh -huh. And so, anyway, that can be a fun thing where they that first they write uh, the poem and then you um, make sure that they've got room where they can add the word brown. Yeah. And, and see that it's an acrostic. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. So there's, um, there's lots of uh, things in this, this poem that we're working with, with the, um, the two frogs that fall in the bowl. Yes. Mm -hmm. bowl. Right. Well, the OW, we do, as part of this, um, the diphthong lesson, we also teach the children that OW can often spell L, mm -hmm. have that sound, but it can also make the O sound as in snow mm -hmm. and crow. And then one of the, um, the fables that we do is the fox and the crow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. towards the end of the week. So again, it's one of those things you can have so much fun being creative, trying to just weave this all together. But the really, you know, kind of important thing we need to keep in mind is this rhythm of in breath and out breath. Yes. Okay. Paying attention. Yeah. When does your yeah. child need to move? Mm -hmm. That um, you are giving enough time to skills practice, which is mainly, you know, the phonics rules you're working on and the sight words you're working on. Um, in this block, mm -hmm. and that um, that the children are getting an opportunity to write at do kid writing at least once a week. Yes, yeah, and that you are reading with them. Gosh, if you could read with, I mean, homeschool is so great. You could read with them every day. Every day, I know, and I know. It's such a gift. I mean, that's what we would be doing in the classroom. Could we? Yeah. And um, so, yes. Anyway, there's. There's just, uh, it's, I'm just so excited for your um, yeah. viewers because it, you can, you know, I say planning, you know, you think about, oh, I have to get up and plan. But actually, if you're delving into poems and stories and, you know, all these different things, how can I be creative? Then, mm -hmm. you know, it's actually just a lot of fun. Well, and I think here, I'm going to stop sharing this so we can come back. I also, I think that what this allows us to see um, with these examples you've provided, Janet, is, is that um, not only can it be fun, but we can also, there can be, in, instead of saying, oh yeah, we're supposed to do some poetry. Oh yeah, we're um, in a story. Oh, in a, make a main lesson book. Oh, in a, you know, like when you think about all the aspects of the Waldorf approach. Right. This allows us to see how all of those things really fit together to, to bring about um, a, a co more comprehensive plan for teaching yes. the, the language skills and concepts that our children need. Right, so, right. Yeah. Well, thank you for letting me share that and uh, happy planning to everybody. Thank you. Thank you sure. so much. And next time, I'm so excited for the, the fourth and final interview. And we'll be talking about really how to um, structure a practice session. Yes. Those, you know, 20, 30, 40 minute short practice times that you'll be doing um, 
you know, doing for math when you're in a language arts block and for language arts when you're in a, a math block to really right. help, help the practice uh, continue on. So, yeah, those are going to transform Waldorf education. Um, I think so. I, I really, really do. And that's the, the feeling that so many homeschoolers have. And it's, it's amazing to see this approach evolving now that we're about to hit 100 years of yes, Waldorf education. Yes, yes. It is really exciting to me. So thank you so much, Janet. Thank for you for letting me share this. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And we will see you next time for interview number four. That's right. That's right. I'm looking forward to it. Bye-bye. Same here. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.